Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'd like to welcome you all warmly on behalf of the Center for Theology, Women, and Gender here to Princeton Seminary uh, to our first keynote address, which will be delivered by the Reverend Mihi Kim Court in just a moment. So Mihi is an ordained Presbyterian minister, and since 2005, she has served in ministry to children, youth, families, college students, and young adults. Her writing and commentary can be found there's a long list, so bear with me, a Time Magazine, BBC World Service, USA Today, Huffington Post, Christian Century, On Being, Sojourners, and the Faith, uh, I'm sorry, and finally Faith and Leadership. And her most recent book is titled Outside the Lines, How Queerness Will Transform Your Faith. Mihi is currently a PhD student in religious studies at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana, where she resides with her family. And her keynote address this evening is titled In Fleshed Faith, A Theology of Mutual Vulnerability. Please join me in welcoming the Reverend Mihi Kim Court. Well, good evening. It is such a joy and privilege to be with you all this week, um, tonight. Honestly, it's kind of mind boggling. Um, I'm a bit flabbergasted that it's been 15 years since I graduated from the MDiv program here. Any class of 2004? Nope. You. Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, and then 10 years since doing the THM program. I did that part-time while I was serving at a church, so that would have been 2008. Anybody here? 2006, 2007, 2008? Woo, oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> Well, it doesn't seem possible, and yet here we are together, and um, I feel super grateful. It's wonderful to be able to be back on campus, to um, remember some of the spaces and the moments. I met my partner here when um, I was 22, dear God. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, it's, it's lovely to be able to, to reminisce and to remember. Um, so after I was a student here from 2001 to 2004, my partner Andy um, and I lived and labored at churches in New York, in New Jersey, and Pennsylvania. And then 2011, after our twins were born, we moved to Bloomington, Indiana, where he pastors First Presbyterian Church. And then I served in campus ministry and did some uh, pulpit supply and provided some uh, interim work for various churches around youth ministry and just tried to keep myself busy, basically, side projects, um, some hobbies here and there, um, before starting in the doctoral program in religious studies um, at IU in the fall of 2017 now. Um, so we had a third child somewhere in there. <laughs> um, we also have two one-year-old cats and a six-month-old boxer. In the words of a dear friend, why? <laughs> Perhaps it's not surprising then that because of the state of our household, because there are many bodies, specifically many mouths and stomachs, my mind is constantly on tables and meals and the many ways that we gather together whether it's at home and the kids are crowded around the kitchen counter and I'm standing over the sink and I'm trying to scarf down food as quick as possible. <laughs> whether it's at our favorite Mexican restaurant in town, like last week where we actually had a civilized meal together with our kids out in public. That doesn't happen. <laughs> it was a miracle, the miracle of miracles is what I call it whether it's around the communion table, whether it's around the coffee table, whether it's around conversation. I cook and feed people actually a lot like my mother. Um, she's a little frantic, a little desperate, very singularly focused. She kind of barks out orders. Um, there's a sort of urgency to her cooking, um, some anxiety, but always, always a desire to give and love as much as possible in that offering. And so my hope and my prayer is that what I offer today will give you a little nourishment, a little sustenance for the journey. So again, I've titled the, the theme for this evening's conversation as Enfleshed Faith. 
a theology of mutual vulnerability. What I want to do for the next little bit is spend time on a few ideas that will hopefully spark some conversations as we think through what is the church? The church with all their flaws and idiosyncrasies, um, yes, even periodic goodness. <laughs> and then what is our role? What is our peculiar role in the church? And I use the word peculiar very intentionally as a way to gesture toward the queerness of our vocation. So some of you may know a little about my story. Much of this really came out of my own life, uh, this sort of working out, um, this burgeoning awareness of my own queerness in terms of identity for sure, um, in terms of gender and sexuality, but definitely in and at numerous levels. Um, you know, we know the language of coming out, but that, that never really totally resonated for me because it felt like something and still feels like something that's ongoing um, and emerging, a sort of being more uh, getting free, a loving deeply. But my coming out, or I should say coming into my own queerness, was a discovery of a kind of mother tongue, a first language, this kind of in utero language, that mother language of love, of expansion, of possibility, a language of queerness. For sure, the theories, the stories, the projects, all of that ruptured my experience and perspective. It, it unformed my worldview. It unformed the scripts of convention and tradition that I had internalized, i.e. what it means to be a girl, what it means to be a woman, what it means to be a pastor, what it means to be a citizen, what it means to be human. And all of that then these stories, the language reformed me. And I think of Psalm 139 for some reason. There was a group of us that read um, some of Mary Sidney's uh, poetry um, around, um, around her psalms. And Psalm 139 happened to be one of them. So what I discovered is the magic. And this is, this is um, language that Darnell Moore, um, also a PT Sem grad, um, author of um, No Ashes in the Fire, he says the magic. This is discovering the magic, the beauty, and the energy of queerness. Or maybe to use language that's familiar to us as people of faith, I discovered the logos, the life-giving, the life-transforming energy of queerness. It's generative, it's provocative, it's liberative. And so why queerness? Why does queerness matter? What does it have to do with the church? Many of you probably know that queerness has been explored, it's been theorized and articulated by scholars and theologians and activists and writers and creatives, and I am deeply, deeply indebted to their work. It has also undergone numerous challenges since the early 90s when, the, when we first encountered the term queer. Um, some transformations, beginning as a way, of course, to describe certain expressions of sexuality and gender, and now to include other markers of identity, like race and ethnicity, and nationality and ability. But the people who first started talking about queerness didn't do so in the ivory towers of the academy. Concepts of queerness came out of flesh and blood lives, from broken hearts and crushed spirits, from the material of ordinary life, and so it matters. Queerness matters for those trying to live, but dying because of who they are and who they love. It matters for those who struggle with this sense of being in between worlds, this pseudo-becoming, these mixed identities at too many levels. It matters for those trying to orient themselves in this world more truthfully. And so it is the streets and neighborhoods, the workplaces and classrooms and the parks and the playgrounds and courthouses and churches that I'm thinking and writing and wrestling from, with, and through that register of everyday life. Because everyday life happens everywhere. Um, and so I do also want to flag that I want to avoid that, um, that sort of dichotomous 
language of streets versus classroom um, because life happens in the ivory tower as well. Um, but it is where people are, where people live, work, and struggle, these spaces in which I am the most compelled by and find that most meaningful, spaces that allow us to create, to question, to collaborate, and to figure out how do we do this thing called life together. So I want to begin by framing out queerness, not in order to capture it, to define it, because there's no way to exhaust the possibilities of queerness, that's antithetical, but as a kind of gesturing towards what it feels like in our bodies. So really tonight I hope is more meditation than presentation. Queerness is posture. And this is the only time I'll put up a definition from the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. <laughs> the position or bearing of the body, whether characteristic or assumed, for a special purpose. The pose of a model or artistic figure. State or condition at a given time, especially with respect to capability, in particular circumstances a conscious mental or outward behavioral attitude. And so I think to approach this um, in terms of its etymology very loosely suggests bodies and contexts. Queerness is not simply linguistic, but it definitely manifests as a resistance to the grammars of both language and culture. It is a way of experimenting. It's a posture towards engaging the creative and imaginative, its potential. It transgresses boundaries and allows us to be without label or category. It is at odds with the normal, the legitimate, the dominant. It is somehow both particular and expansive. And it's more space not a singular identitarian category or simply a social or political project or even a methodology, but a space for all people to find genuine and authentic footing in relation to one another. To the queer theorist Jose Esteban Munoz, queerness was not a label people could claim, but a complete reimagining of how people could be he says, we may never touch queerness, but we can feel it as the warm illumination of a horizon imbued with potentiality. And that comes out of his book, Cruising Utopia. Queerness is playfulness. It is experimenting a mixing and mingling, a throwing out of the manual. It is recognizing the Holy Spirit, that wild child of the Trinity, and our wildest imaginations. It's surprising and catches you off guard. It makes space for dress up and acting, pulling out all the pots and pans, banging on the tops, and then running around the house using them as superhero shields. That has actually happened in our home and happens regularly. It is trial and error. It is cannonballing into the waters of definition, those definitions of identity, and then splashing water into the face of what is divine and human. And it always tends toward a dynamic generosity, a grace that allows for mistakes and failures because our lives are richer when we hold all of what is human. Queerness is practice. It is an ethic, something that is practiced and experienced that has intention behind it. For some, it is an expression. For others, it is a choice. For others, still it is advocacy. For others, it is survival. It is always personal, but it has to be social and political. It addresses the real world, the everyday, and all the struggles inherent inside and outside a person. It is an act of protest, a revolt, a demonstration, and always a rallying around people's humanity and dignity when larger institutions, those powers that be, the principalities, threaten it.
I had a suspicion um, that I was queer in college, but I tried to tamp it down. And I think it may explain why that as a college student, I was involved with an abnormally, unusually high number of Christian communities. <laughs> I attended meetings from everything, um, for everything from navigators to intervarsity to the Presbyterian campus ministry to an Asian American community to Campus Crusade for Christ, although now that's crew. Uh, still is problematic, that name. <laughs> it seemed like many of the students around me picked one, but for some reason, I just couldn't squeeze myself into one group, maybe. Maybe I didn't want to think about certain things but I never felt like I completely belonged anywhere. But the main group that gave me a way to do ministry as well as have sort of these meaningful friendships was Young Life, a non-denominational evangelical ministry to high school and middle school students led by college students. And while there's much that I now find myself at odds with, it did give me one of the more formative seasons in ministry and personal faith. It was really one of the driving forces behind why I went into ministry. I was 19 or 20 with other 19 and 20 year olds being trained to do this very strange and risky thing of loving people. And in that we were encouraged to immerse ourselves in theology and the language of our faith. And so I remember at the time there were a handful of books that made the rounds in the group. Uh, lovely spiritual memoirs by Brendan Manning, Bible studies on various books, classic works including Oswald Chambers, My Utmost for His Highest. Anybody? Yeah. All these shaped my faith. And then there was one book by John Piper. It was called Desiring God. Anyone remember this one? Oh, God, I see some cringy, cringy faces. <laughs> Honestly, I never fully read it. I pretended I did. <laughs> when I finally got my hands on it, after so many people raved about it, I was entering my senior year in college. And not only was I feeling senioritis and a little of the sort of smug know-it-all that comes with getting ready to graduate and take on the world. My head was stuffed to the gills with theories on religion and philosophies and anthropologies. Um, parts of my mind were also awakening to some glimmering questions around race and gender and sexuality. And when I opened um, the book to the introduction, the first few lines suggested it would lead me back down a path that was too familiar and that felt painful. Treading over paths that just, again, did not seem viable to me any longer. And also the book was really long <laughs> and wordy. It had too many like long block quotes and long scripture passages, so you know, I just skimmed it. But Desiring God is centered around the Westminster Shorter Catechism which asks and answers, what is the chief end of man? To glorify God and to enjoy him forever. This is one of the main confessions or statements of faith for those who belong to the capital R Reformed Faith. I cannot read that question and answer without hearing the trembling voice of our sweet little white Sunday school teacher. My immigrant church rented space from a congregation that was dying out, whose minister had passed away and she was his widow. And she loved our little Korean church. She was there every Sunday trying to make this sort of unruly group of second generation Korean American children recited together as a start to our Sunday lesson, Sunday school lessons. But it never really gave much thought to the words how glorifying God and enjoying God were connected. You may have read this book and you um, may have really enjoyed it and it may have formed you and shaped you in a particular way. Or you may have never heard of it. Maybe like me, you disagree with the politics of John Piper. Either way, there is one thing I did glean from his notion of Christian hedonism. It was that enjoying God was a way to glorify God. 
In other words, pleasure and happiness are good. The longing for those things is universal. And desire is connected to joy. And the pursuit of pleasure is necessary, as he writes, for worship and virtue. Something like that. And yes, I did get most of that from the introduction. <laughs> but I keep going back to the title. And although, again, I recoil now because of his very narrow understanding of Christianity, I think he may have given me something important. Instead of desiring being a verb with us, us as the subject, as Piper intends it, I see the possibility of reading it as an adjective, modifying and enhancing this image of God, a desiring God, a God who desires. And so I want us to go to the feeling, that longing, the yearning to desire, for that to be a source, the possible source of knowledge, to be a kind of knowing. We have plenty examples of this in scripture, a passionate God, whether in the Song of Songs or the Psalms, whether Hosea or Isaiah, where we see God desires intensely, obsessively, and wants the people. God, newly in love and newly obsessed with a recently rescued but non-committal Israel, following them through the desert, wooing them with milk and honey and cakes and delectable meats, but lashing out in hurt and anger when Israel chooses instead a powerless golden calf. God desperate to prove their fire and devotion that will not be denied, showboating for Israel by drying up oceans, stopping rivers, and tearing down the walls of cities to dust crumbles, only to catch Israel's eyes wandering time and time again. It is easy for us to imagine God's passion for us, God's longing and desire for us in this way. God is really into us. <laughs> From contemporary worship songs to the words of St. Teresa of Avila, a venerated Catholic saint from the 16th century who wasn't afraid to speak of this love. I saw an angel very near me, towards my left side in bodily form. He had in his hands a long golden dart. At the end of the point, methought there was a little fire, and I felt him thrust it several times through my heart in such a way that it passed through my very bowels. And when he drew it out, methought it pulled them out with it and left me wholly on fire with a great love of God. It's hot. What is it that compels Teresa to speak of God in this way? Her barely contained desire and its desperations and its poetic erotics. This deviates from our norms. And of course, what purity culture has told us is that it is antithetical to the experience of faith because faith is pure. It is intellectual and systematic and rational and cerebral. But I want to suggest that this kind of desiring God wholly and fully happens when we recognize that we are face to face with a desiring God. A God who also yearns for our happiness, our joy, and yes, even our pleasure. To, re to reiterate the Westminster Shorter Catechism, this is God's glory. To delight in a gorgeous cityscape or breathe in a mountain scene or drink deeply from the side of the ocean at sunset or a delectable meal, and yes, even a physical intimacy with another person. All of this is connected to desire. All of this is connected to God's glory. And so a desiring God flips the world upside down for me. My desire for God comes out of God's desire for me. That probably sounds familiar somewhere in the letters of or to John. But my faith is made more meaningful irresistible, interesting, multi-layered when I understand that God's love for me is like the passion of a lover who is hungry and thirsty for me. A desiring God is a game changer for someone like me who grew up straddling cultures that rejected the body, tried to ignore the existence of the body's nerve endings. I was afraid of feelings, of emotions, especially when it came to pleasure. And so I want to suggest that desire is a human experience that is meant to not only reflect God's own desire for us, but it is recursive. 
while it expands our experience of God's yearning for us, it might actually show up as intimacy and connection with the whole world. So I'm working a lot from gender theorist Lauren Berlant, writer of a very short but dense book titled Love Slash Desire. For Berlant, love and desire might be better understood as separate experiences. Desire is the attachment, the feeling of the possibility of the fulfillment of that connection. It contains the particular uniqueness of that object and all the promises, hopes, and dreams that we project onto the attachment. Love, on the other hand, is, is a result of that desire reciprocated, where that experience of connection expands your understanding of yourself. But Berlant actually complicates this by looking at the realities of power dynamics and relationships, the political issues surrounding monogamy and the institution of marriage, the role of family and property, and the impact of religious and cultural ideals. Love, as we often experience in the world today, is actually very messy and complicated. And so rather than seeing love as an absolute or a universal phenomenon, Berlant proposes that instead of love, perhaps it is desire that is the heart of the human experience. And so I too want to propose that the language of desire is a way to open up what it means that God loves us. We have all these beautiful metaphors of God's love for us as a father, as a mother hen, as a king, as a priest, as shepherd, as lover even. But what if rather than the normative expressions of God's love, we played with the possibility of desire? Because love sometimes seems more like institutionalized desire as desire that is captured and packaged and commodified, fraught with conventions and rituals and traditions and regulations, straight-laced and missionary-style love. But querying love, is that another way? In other words, what I'm saying is recognizing desire behind love, under love, before love, might be a way to breathe new life into a fire that has run out of oxygen. Desire might give us a more fuller, audacious picture of who we are, albeit one that requires more intentional engagement, discernment, and communication. And love is just one way we know about it, and we live it out. What a person desires tells the truth of their being. This was in a line in a movie directed by Deepa Mehta called Fire. <coughs> Desire frees us to see our innermost being, and that shines a light into the caverns of each person around us. And when the desire is given space for expression, all our existing boundaries dissolve away. And these are boundaries not just between people, but the kinds of lines that are drawn around individuals, marking off who we think we are or should be and what that looks like. When desire, though, is rooted in flesh and blood bodies and intimacies in all its varied forms, it is an expression of faith in a God who originates and also reciprocates love. And that love is called out in its fullest expression in all our relationships. And so queer intimacies are a gift. They're radical expressions of desire that open up traditional definitions. And they invite us into understanding our humanity in new ways. Now, this is not a call to a particular kind of sexuality, but to recognize desire as a picture of God's orientation toward us, which also means a rupture to our kinship structures, to our notions of family, neighbor, friend, church. If God loves us, no, desires us, with the kind of feeling and commitment and passion that is uncontainable, whether by language or category, i.e. a queer love, then this posture that exceeds our language, our metaphors, our linguistic containers, this posture is what it means to not only live faithfully, live courageously, 
but to live in reciprocity and mutuality with this desiring God. Desire is congruent with the shift I make away from being embodied to our being f enfleshed. A move away from, from body, bordered and regulated, again, easily commodified, propertizable, institutionalized, and towards a potential and possibility of flesh. Flesh that is excessive, that is erotic, that is unassimilable, that is uncontrollable and unpredictable flesh, that is the Holy Spirit with bone and blood. Flesh is connected to dirt, to the earth, to our mother's flesh. And so what are we called to in flesh in this world? I love the story of the Samaritan woman in John 4, the one who met Jesus at a well. The gospel tells us while Jesus made his way from Judea to Galilee, he makes a stop at Jacob's well in a Samaritan city called Sychar. Jesus is tired out by his journey, and when a woman approaches the well, he speaks to her. He says to her, give me a drink. These four words once completely undid me because I saw it as a moment of transgression. In speaking to the Samaritan woman, Jesus chose to disidentify with the rules and conventions that dictate, that structure interactions, socially, politically, culturally, religiously, legally. And I'm again informed by Jose Esteban Munoz, who describes disidentifying, and he's also riffing off of Judith Butler, but takes it a step further. And I'm sorry, I forgot to put this huge quote up on a slide, so I'll just read it slowly. Disidentification is about recycling and rethinking encoded meaning. The process scrambles and reconstructs the encoded message of a cultural text in a fashion that both exposes the encoded messages, universalizing and exclusionary machinations, recircuits its workings to account for and include and empower minority identities and identifications. So disidentification is a step further than cracking open the code of the majority. It proceeds to use this code as raw material for representing a disempowered politics or positionality that has originally been rendered unthinkable, illegible, unrecognizable by the dominant culture. It is a strategy of transformation and resistance. Give me a drink. It doesn't mean to completely shed one's commitments. That's impossible, right, as embodied beings that are always socially located. Though Jesus seems to reject these societal norms, he remains a first century Palestinian Jewish man. He is a regular participant of synagogue life. He observes the Sabbath and other important festivals and holidays. He even attends dinners and weddings. But these four words that Jesus utters is a moment this is a moment of disidentification in the way that they bring to the foreground, first and foremost, his humanity, breaking through the code of the majority and dominant and verbalizing the unthinkable, his vulnerability. This very request for help was more than an invitation. It was a rupture, a rending and an opening. And the scripture passage tells us that the woman, the Samaritan woman, responds to him, engages him, critiques him. How is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? She's working through that dominant majority code. She vocalizes the identities that shape them and flags the expectations for their interactions. But the reality that she asks herself, asks her very being, Raising this question is astonishing. 
they are both shirking convention at the time. We know about the enmity between Samaritans and Jews, and here he is not only speaking to her, but admitting his vulnerability, asking for her help. Her, a Samaritan, a Samaritan woman. What we see then is that his vocalization, his expression. I have a body. Give me a drink because I'm thirsty. Becomes a way in which the Samaritan woman recognizes her own positionality. And then the precariousness of those systems, those dominant majority codes in which she resides. And then she's able to recognize her own humanity, her own vulnerability, her own thirst. And this mutual vulnerability occurred because Jesus transgressed those normative boundaries. Having a body matters. Being flesh and blood matters. It's the experiences our flesh goes through, large and small, both the trauma and the daily nudges and collisions from the external world mapped out on our bodies. All of this makes us human and divine. Bodies matter so much that Jesus even came back from the dead in his own body. In that same despised, abused, and tortured body, and it's an incredible picture of solidarity and not an embrace of violence, as some are, are want to point out. It is a reminder, actually, that the exclusion, that the diminishment and dehumanization of certain bodies are still realities in the world that we live in, and that God with us means way more than empathy. It is a shared and lived experience. It's a mutual vulnerability. The embodied, the wounded, and scarred Jesus shapes my understanding then of how and why all our bodies matter, how it is the ground of our being. Since I began with food, I wanted to circle back around to food or what is connected to food, and that is what it might mean to enflesh our faith in this world that is in terms of hospitality. And it's interesting, isn't it, to think about hospitality like that's supposed to be in a woman's domain, right? Um, like you never hear of questions about who's serving, I don't know, the coffee, like um, in a session meeting. You know, that's for the deacons, that's for the ladies. But there is something potentially subversive about hospitality. The global leader for the radically inclusive metropolitan community churches, Reverend Dr. Nancy Wilson, draws on a definition of promiscuous in what she calls queer people's penchant for promiscuous hospitality. It's an orientation outwards towards others, and particularly the other when it is enacted as an expression of that enfleshed faith, desire becomes a kind of promiscuous hospitality poured out. Now, I know the word promiscuous is uncomfortable. You know, it's loaded with lots of stuff. <laughs> but it is rooted in the Latin word for to mix and carries with it more of a sense of bringing together various elements. This notion of promiscuity as indiscriminate mingling is a far cry from the negative cultural definition of promiscuous we use in a more judgmental way. And so I want to suggest that to queer hospitality invites us to think beyond concepts of welcome and even inclusion so that people are not simply objects of certain outreach programs, additive and supplemental to our community, querying hospitality is about deluge and excess, making space for the Holy Spirit to blow open all the doors in human action and in interaction, in human connection, in that moment of, of human contact. It's not selective or methodical, but overflowing a hospitality that is a continuous recognition of another's humanity, 
a loving, again, solidarity with that person in front of you, across the aisle, walking towards you on the sidewalk, or next to you in the pew. And I'll say that again, hospitality then is actually solidarity because it's an entanglement. It is intimacy. It's a constant being with, a recognition that there is, in the words of um, Denise Ferreira da Silva, difference without separability. Because it requires all of ourselves, all our bodies. And yeah, it's going to be risky and awkward a lot of times, but queer, again, this kind of welcome is mutually vulnerable. So queerness or a theology of mutual vulner vulnerability and an enfleshed faith invites us to see that salvation actually has to do with our bodies, with our flesh and blood. Salvation isn't about a golden ticket to heaven, but it is about the here and now, our experience in and through our flesh and blood in this moment. I skipped a couple of slides. Every moment becomes potentially sacramental then, holy and sacred and set apart so that even what is mundane can become a prayer, a supplication, a liturgy, opening us up to what is divinely felt, a taste, a sip, a sprinkle of that profound and continuous intimacy. And so it is in these times of uncertainty, of division, of separability, the, 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 foolish, the, the foolishness of liberal projects of autonomy and self-determination and individuation, this language of false news and hard facts and changing facts. Maybe it's poetry. Maybe it's flesh. Maybe it's spirit that points us to God's spirit. Maybe it's feeling and desire that points us to God's presence in and through us, these gatherings, through the testimonies of our very bodies. And perhaps what is true is not that we are meant to have this system of consistent desires and steady ambitions, as if each person is a metaphysical being totally aware of oneself at all times, unless maybe that person is a bodhisattva or Gandhi. The rest of us, regular humans, are each an amalgamation of stories and dreams, histories and genetics, easily affected by lunar cycles, and barometric pressure and sunshine. We're made of stardust, as one scientist likes to remind us. Each of us is a complicated mashup of ancestors and cultures and ideologies and time periods. But we are created in flesh and blood, in the image of the one who is named I am who I am, and somehow called to that same work of creation, of formation, of enfleshing, of imagining, of redeeming, of calling out, of sanctifying, of living and moving and breathing throughout this world. I was randomly looking up Baudrillard, and I thought of um, I was looking out my, out, out my window in my, um, my student office, and then I thought of a room with a view, and then I, <laughs> I'm just going through this process, but it usually doesn't make sense when I come across these things. I found um, this quote by E.M. Forster, uh, the author of this particular book. We know that we come from the winds and that we shall return to them that all life is perhaps a knot, a tangle, a blemish in the eternal smoothness. But why should this make us unhappy? Let us love one another and work and rejoice. Thank you.